Thank you, Jeremy, for being on the show. Finally, after we tried Finally. last year very hard yes. <laughs> to figure this out, but you were still in Africa, right? I was. I, I was think. in Rwanda. Rwanda. Okay. So, but first of all, we would like to a little bit of introduce you. D just let me know if the pronunciation is right. Jeremy, do you say wheat? Wheat. Yes, wheat, as in the cereal crop. Yes. Okay. So you are um, a philosopher. You wrote a book, A Young Person's Guide to Philosophy, a bestseller, I should say. Yeah, I made so um, much money from it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, you shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, then you provided advice for governments, companies, and civil society organizations in over 20 countries. And you spent 12 years in Nigeria between 2003 and 15 and visited Gabon in 2016 and were initiated into Viti, which we talk about in a second, and got quite accustomed with the plant of Ibogaine, the big mysterious plant that everybody starts talking about now. Maybe tell us a little bit, first of all, how this all kind of happened because it seemed like it wasn't like a straight line <clears throat> yeah i've never been a linear type person um <clears throat> from an early age i didn't want to have a conventional career path um i used to stare at myself in the mirror when i was 10 and that experience of looking in the mirror and thinking hold on how come the experience of looking in the mirror at myself is different to the experience of looking at other people and i used to get uncannily spooked by just that mirror experience um, and couldn't explain it to myself. And perhaps even today, I can't really explain why it's so strange looking at yourself in the mirror. And actually just jumping fast forwards um, in the Buiti tradition, there's this whole thing about holding a mirror to yourself when you're on Iboga and falling into yourself. So um, it's interesting. I, have, I only just thought of that, actually, that connection. So yes, it, so that led me into philosophy and trying to figure out sort of the, the, the biggest questions. And um, actually the first year of my philosophy degree, I was a very average student, very middling, um, you know, just sitting at the back of the class and coasting. And then I went through the experience of my grandfather dying, uh, my father's father. And I had a very close relationship with him. Um, he was a rural working man. Um, didn't have any time for leisure pursuits during his working life. And then as an older man, he and I bonded and I taught my grandfather how to fish um, and spent many hours sitting next to him fishing in quiet tranquility. And um, anyway, him dying was the first person I knew that I'd been close with who died. And it just woke me the F up. And um, I fell very deep into philosophy at that point. And got a high first and that led me to doing a PhD. So it's the only thing I can do is philosophy. Okay, let me do that. Um, and then I failed to get an academic job and became a consultant. And eventually that led me to Nigeria. And I've never been one of these people who loves Africa and, you know, giraffes and acacia tree. <laughs> I just, you know, I find that slightly revolting. Mm. But at the same time, I've been drawn there on another level, despite myself. So I spent many years living in different African circumstances. And when I uh, first heard about Iboga about 10, 15 years ago, it just was like a bolt through my brain. It was like, oh my God, there is this entheogen, there is this molecule, there is this plant, there is this tradition which goes way back deep in deep into the mists of time with the pygmies. And yeah, it was another it was another wake up experience. Um, and again, wrapped around death because Puiti is very much about the underworld and the death realm. And um, uh, you know, the rite of passage is very much that uh, you're a child, and you put away childish things by going into this other this ancestral realm and connecting with the spirits. And then after that experience, you go out and um, you know you're ready to be a member of the compute community and adult effectively so, so this is this is buiti right this Just is buiti people. yes yeah okay buiti or buiti yeah. um so yes i i you know in summary and i have a calling for this thing um and i it's sub-rational it's something i can't really explain it's sort of like becoming a priest or a monk or something it's something i'm impelled to do 
uh, and I'm doing, and I'm very grateful. For many years, I was just in the wilderness like other people um, working in psychedelics and plant medicines, never knew that this was going to happen in quite the way it's happened and was just doing it, you know, and even if there wasn't the big commercial sort of fizz around psychedelics now, I'd still be doing it. It's I'm not motivated by money or fame or any of those things. I'm, and it makes it. It make I make myself seem like some big expert. I, you know, what do I know? I don't, I don't know anything. You know, that's how I feel. But I mean, so you you found this? Let's like you say, calling when you did your first iboga experience, or maybe already a couple. Okay. Before, like, before, um, just the idea was a call, the idea was the the connection I'd been waiting for. Um, so I, I have no explanation for what this is. Maybe you know I was African in a previous life. Maybe you know maybe there's some ancestral connection for me, or I have no idea what it is. It's a big mystery for me. I can't explain it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how how was the the first time you really got in touch? Did somebody take you to a ceremony or? It just happened to be there. Uh, I found out about a guy in the UK who is much deeper into Boiti than me. Um, and I first went to Glastonbury, a very spiritual, mm -hmm. sacred part of the UK, a confluence of ley lines. And uh, my first experience with the sacred wood was very close to Glastonbury, quite appropriately. Um, And through him, I got in touch with some people that were even deeper into the Gabonese lineages of Boiti and... Um, You know, they're my friends today. And uh, yeah, eventually, as you said in the beginning, I, I found myself in Gabon going through this incredible initiation experience. And yeah, it's just it's just like, I don't know, staring at a big waterfall or, or a powerful river. You, you know, I admire this thing from the banks. You know, I don't really understand it. I have superficial knowledge compared to other people, but um, it's a very powerful force that goes back many thousands of years. If you think about it, The Amazonian rainforest is perhaps only seven, eight thousand years old, whereas the rainforests in Central Africa are tens of thousands of years old. And the people of the rainforest have been practicing and working with this sacrament for, you know, te possibly tens of thousands of years. But I mean, I, before we go into the the incredible root, you could call it, or molecule, um, so because I, I read up a lot about recently about Iboga and this this kind of rite of passage and I didn't really know about this and I think it's a really interesting thing where why I thought like is this maybe a good thing to have also in terms of mental health for a person or a human being I mean in that case I think it's rather men than women I think in Africa right oh but tell me if I'm wrong but I mean what I read is that men have that rite of passage and <laughs> to say it maybe like suffer from this being the like a boy forever which is i think sometimes if you look at men who actually <laughs> have this <laughs> have this kind of forever boyish thing it kind of brings them also a lot of problems in the end right if they turn rather in in their 50s suddenly they still haven't experienced responsibilities that they should take over and I mean, I thought I thought it was very interesting that this root actually contributes to this passage. So, did you look into things like that, or did you thought about these kind of natural transitions that we kind of lost all altogether? Yeah, I know. You know, I've, the conference tomorrow I'll be talking about this in passing. You know, oh good, in, okay. You know, in sort of pr particularly in Protestant North European cultures and the spin-offs. Um, we have, you know, compared to Catholic European cultures, but in, in Protestant North European cultures, we've really become de-ritualized and de -sacralized. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think about the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism by Weber, you know, during my student days. So definitely the Protestant collective soul yearns for ritual processes like an, an initiation And, you know, yeah, other cultures, Catholic cultures, Jewish cultures, they still have um, this body of, of ritual. So the North European Protestant soul, yeah, is is empty in a way. And um, just to go back to what you were saying um, with Bwiti and uh, gender, definitely women are as involved as, um, as men. Um, and there are, um, you know, women-only traditions uh, and, uh, you know, Bwiti internally is highly complex. 
You know, again, mm-hmm. I hesitate, you know, what do I know about Wheaty? I've scratched the surface. There are people that can speak much more authoritatively than me, but from the sidelines with my little knowledge, definitely it's for women as much as men. Um, I agree, you know, that this kid alt phenomenon of uh, men not growing up is is definitely a, a function of um, not having these kind of collecting states, collective staging posts al- along the way. Um, and that's why, you know, we're, so many Europeans are, and Americans and North Americans are drawn to, you know, go to the Amazon or in a smaller numbers, you know, go to the rainforests of Gabon and, and go through the, this experience because it, it was part of our culture centuries ago and it's, you know, in our DNA, but it's, you know, it's all been lost. I mean, I know you've spoken and I know you know about, you know, the kind of deep ancestral origins of European culture and, you know, Greek ceremony and all that. We had all of it, you know, and um, mm-hmm. over the centuries we lost it and we're alienated. So, um, uh, but that's not to say that we recreate Buiti as it is in Gabon, you know, in, in America no. or in yeah. Europe or anything like that. But it's interesting that it's another thing that comes back to in this whole discussion about Ibogaine, like uh, in psilocybin and kind of LSD comes back into the kind of to look at religion in a new way, like Brian Moresco is doing. And I mean, I'm never heard about this. And I mean, I come from a Roman Catholic family and I know every little detail from the Bible, I think, but I've literally never had like anything about this uh, elusis or like spiked yeah. LSD beer. So this is just the knowledge that comes back. Uh, this is on the way back since maybe like two years, unless you're maybe like a super hardcore scientist in Oxford or Amanda Fielding and you know about these things for a, for a while. But um, in general, I find it interesting that this is coming back massively right now. But um, so, but I think you, you also... You did, or are you are still doing a movie on Ibogaine? Is that right? Ah, yes. Uh, we have all the footage, and um, you know, sometimes there can just be issues in the team, and you know, people have to take time out, and it's one of those stories. So, I would love mm-hmm. this footage to come to life at some point. I think one of the things that I'm honored and privileged to be in a position of is I've come to know people in the Ibogaine community, and. Um, well, in, in terms of this conference that's coming up tomorrow and Saturday, um, you know, the people that are organizing it for us, you know, they've organized many psychedelic conferences and they say, God, people in the Ibogaine community are like nothing else. And it really is true. It's, um, it's a very special, extremely colorful, dramatic community of people. Um, you know, people who've gone through the kind of depths of hell with addiction and trauma mm-hmm. and come out the other side of it tend to be uh powerful characters shall we say and then you know the irony or paradox of ibogaine or ibogaine is that although it's all about anti-addiction and interrupting addiction it itself as a subject is quite addictive you know you kind of you skirt around ibogaine or ibogaine you can call it both things by the way um Mm -hmm. And people get sucked into it. Oh my God. And then you, you know, you, you know, now that I've been in it, I'm a bit of a gray beard these days, I guess, but um, you have a kind of, uh, you know, beginner's mind type thing, you know, people really fall into it and then get very, very excited. Oh, if everybody took Ibogaine and, you know, the, and so, yeah, there is something curiously compelling about Ibogaine, even if, you know, it is anti-addictive ultimately as a molecule. Did you ever see this movie Dosed? Yes, I did. Um, what I would say there is that and it's just funny how things get thrown up and surfaced, but the representations of Ibogaine treatment so far have not been the best, shall we say. Mm-hmm. So um, not to cast aspersions or be negative about the particular place that um, Adrian goes to. It's not from my perspective, and it's not a judgment, it's just from my perspective that wasn't a representation of Ibogaine treatment at its best um, for various reasons. And so it's funny that, yeah, that there's quite a few Ibogaine films where you see things go wrong, basically. And of course, you know, from a documentary perspective, you want to have that dramatic tension of things going wrong before they go right. But yeah, it doesn't present the optimum model of Ibogaine treatment. And um, it's a pity we're still waiting for that, that representation in film. So you mean like, 
for example, like you now would have movies or documentations or even TV shows on psilocybin and LSD, there needs to be like a uh, like a follow up for a fiber gain kind of. Yeah, and you know, and there's just something very weird about this, which we don't understand, which is that maybe ibogaine is resisting. You know, mm -hmm. if just let me stage this a little bit. If if consciousness is non-local, if it's like a field and it's not just generated materially from our brains, so our brains tap into it. Maybe ibogaine is like a center of energy in this consciousness field, and it controls what happens and stops things happening in a certain way. So it prevents linearity. It stops itself from being represented in a certain way. I'm just, it's very, very speculative, but it, you know, truth be told, it feels that way to me, that Ibogaine does not move in a straight path and it will not. And it, um, we are selected by it um, and it can discard us if it wants to, you know, we have to be careful with it. It's something odd about working with it that it's, it occurs mm -hmm. to me. I can't quite put my finger on what it is. I mean, it seems to me more like an abstract idea rather than, for example, psilocybin. Mm -hmm. The main thing you would read if you, let's say, go on Google and read about it is that it's the best uh, psychedelic to use if you have like a strong opioid addiction and or alcohol addiction. So, But before we get into universal ibogaine and your kind of role and your plans for the company. So how would you say, how would you describe to somebody how is the trip, the Ibogaine trip different than the LSD and psilocybin experience, which seems to be like almost like a nice little excursion. <laughs> to to It's very, very different. I mean, I, you know, I, psilocybin is very, very precious to me. Um, and me I've only had a few trips because it's so sacred. Mm. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, even, even if you take it with a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which I've done in the past and you have a long psilocybin trip, it's still only seven or eight hours. Um, whereas it's almost like an ibogaine trip. It starts before you've actually taken the ibogaine. Again, it's like distorting the field of consciousness ahead of itself. And the big difference is um, it affects the body big time. So where with, with psilocybin, you might have that kind of rush, that kind mm -hmm. of sense of surging before it really kicks in. You sort of have that and then it keeps on going with the body. So it's a much more embodied experience rather than sort of like a mental, cerebral, purely spiritual experience. So even with relatively small amounts, you can feel giddy and dizzy and you see sort of stars floating around. But if you have any significant amount of Iboga or Ibogaine, you, there's a period where you can't really move your body. You have what's called ataxia. You have to be helped to go to the toilet. You can't stand up. Um, and if you're having a flood dose, you know, to treat addiction, then you'll have, you know, 24, 24 hours after, you know, your peak experience, you'll have a gray day, as it's called, where you just feel crap and you don't want to get up. And particularly for people with opiate addiction and um, resetting those opioid uh, receptors to their pre-addicted state is a huge deal. And you'll often find, you know, heroin or opioid addicts coming through the Ibogaine experience. They have what's called restless leg syndrome and they just feel crap. And, um, you know, the comfort blanket of, you know, being, you know, having their opioid receptors, you know, suffusing the brain with dopamine, that's all gone. And you're back to being a human being with aches and pains and the world as it is. And psychologically, it's a huge deal for people to come through that. And, you know, they often say, I don't mean to put them outside by saying they, but people that have gone through that experience feel that it hasn't worked. They have post-acute withdrawal symptom. Uh, they, they, they get all het up and worried. Oh no, it didn't work for me. But that's just them being restored to what it is to be a human being with aches and pains and, you know, this, that, and the other. So anyway, summarizing it, it's a hugely different experience to the serotonergic um, classic psychedelic experience. We can just jump right into the Universal Ibogaine company, which you kind of, I mean, it's kind of still a young company, right? I mean, you, you founded it like last year, I think. Uh, 2018, yeah. Um, it was set up 18. by... Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
a Canadian capital markets guru, Shane Nyquist, and uh, Dr. Alberto Sola, who runs mm -hmm. a Ibogaine clinic in, in Cancun. Uh, this was back in 2018, and I joined the board uh, in February last year, a year ago, in fact. Mm -hmm. Jumped in as CEO, as an internal CEO um, from June. And then this is my last month, actually, as CEO. And um, I'm handing the baton over to a pharmaceutical expert um, to focus on, you know, quite rightly to focus on the clinical trials aspect, which is the core of the company. And I'll be mm -hmm. sitting back as a board member, uh, you know, just, just still as passionate and keen about the company succeeding. Um, but the big push now is the science side of things. Um, preparing for clinical trials, sourcing the ibogaine, which is uh, can be a bit tricky. Um, getting the protocol right, working with uh, you know technical partners. But my you know my push uh, back on the board will be look. Let's not forget the holistic side of things, the therapeutic side. You know I really believe in the the maps model. You know of molecule assisted psychotherapy. It's not. I don't. You know, I'm quite firm in my opinions that I don't buy into the biomedical model of psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, the patient does the work, whether it's psilocybin or LSD or Ibogaine or whatever it is. It's up to the, you know, the set and setting, the intentionality, you know, um, the aftercare and all of that. So I'll continue to push that with the company. And what people often don't know about the company is that we recognize that not just me, we have um, a, a hereditary stroke, politically elected First Nations chief on our board. And we're starting to connect the dots with all kinds of uh, spiritual, powerful spiritual indigenous people in North mm -hmm. America. And basically what's happening, which I'm really, really excited about, Anne, is uh, the kind of revalidation of indigenous spiritual healing practices mm -hmm. across Canada, across America, and what happens when you insert, you know, entheogens into that context? And it's complicated and it will take time, you know, and it's about developing relationships and trust, no rushing, you know, no, not to be transactional or overly commercial about these things. So Universal Ibogaine definitely has these two sides, which are sort of not antithetical, but they're different from each other. One is very, very focused on pushing Ibogaine through clinical trials. It failed in the 90s. It must not fail this time. Um, and that's leading to sort of high-end clinics, you know, for wealthy people. But at the same time as a company, we recognize that Ibogaine should be available for everyone, not just wealthy people. Um, so that's where we have this other side, which is community outreach. And particularly in the case of Canada, where there's much higher rates of addiction among First Nations, Indigenous people, and so we recognize as a company that we must we must be talking with them and have some leadership from them inside the company and all the rest of it. Before we get into the clinical trials, what I saw on your on your site, and it, as far as I remember, it's the only time I've seen this so far, that you have somebody for indigenous relations yep. on the team, like yep. straight if you click Absolutely. on team, it's three of you guys or four, and then... Um, Dr. Frank Albo, it's his name. Yeah. So, I mean, is this something that you um, thought of from the get-go? Because it, it's kind of interesting that, like I said, I mean, even now that there's kind of a consciousness around in, including indigenous people or kind of I mean, South America, or like whenever they come up with a healing uh, history to include them and also like, for example, also pay them. <laughs> Yep. once you work with them. But I mean, still, like I said, I haven't seen this on many sides. So was this something that you said, okay, look, this has to be part of the the sea level, basically? I think, you know, that, got, that, that was Shane's call, Shane Nyquist, who's our chair. And I think he, he is a visionary in the, you know, he, he, if he was here now, he would say, you know, I've heard him say this many times, he came from the wrong side of the tracks in Winnipeg, central Canada, so he came from the outside, and I think he's got this outsider quality to him, or he recognizes the power and the importance of outsiders. And yeah, anybody from the wrong side of the tracks in Canada can also empathize with the people that are ultimately on the wrong side of the tracks, which is, you know, First Nations communities. So again, Chief Chief Ian Campbell on our board, um, he will say if he was here that um, his parents 
were basically banned from their practices. It was illegal to practice mm -hmm. you know, like First Nations spiritual, cultural practices. His is the first generation which was allowed to. So there's this real, it's almost like the ground is vibrating. And I've been privileged to be on Zoom calls with some people from, you know, spiritual uh, knowledge keepers. And it's sort of been like on a call with the Dalai Lama. It's like you want to sit at their feet mm -hmm. and just shut up and listen because there's so much spiritual force within the within these traditions. And yeah, it's sort of like we're not we cannot go to them and dictate and say, oh, this is Ibogaine, this is what we're going to do, this is what we'll do for you. Anything remotely colonial or projecting, we have to listen and listen and listen and understand and learn and be humble. And in that space, at some point, the trust will have emerged. And we have to do ceremony with them as well. You know, their way of doing business is, first of all, we must do ceremony together. Um, so it's on their terms, not on our terms. So it's it's a fascinating case study. And on the one hand, you're a commercial business. You're going to list on the, you know, Toronto Stock Exchange, you know, all of that capital market side of things, la di da But on the other side, you know, I'm keenly aware that it can't be that. And there's a huge raging debate in psychedelics about the corporatization. And yeah, as a company, we're trying to keep it together and be holistic and whole about this and not veer too much in one direction. And I think it does come down to Shane sort of seeing that and realizing that at a deep level. So yeah, to answer your question from the inception, we had that idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, Maybe you can talk a little bit about what you would like to research in the clinical trials. I mean, we had Deborah Mesh on, on a show in, in summer. Yes. And I was mostly fascinated by this Maya Mivais molecule that she, <laughs> she found out, like the mixture of cocaine and alcohol that just creates like a yeah. whole new yeah. molecule, Co which Kathleen. also until then, I never really heard about. And at the same time, in the big cities, especially here in Berlin, um, there's so many people who mixing these two substances and who like in, in a classic nightlife situation and um i remember talking to a friend of mine saying like why don't you just do alcohol or just cocaine and then he said like i can't i can't do one or the other i i'm, I'm kind of obsessed by doing these things together And so, but Deborah, I remember she said that kind of to clean up that kind of addiction, for example, is almost impossible with any other psychedelic but ibogaine. And um, so I think obviously it's like looking into new molecules that are formed by opioids maybe that we don't know, that we just encounter right now. But I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about how, what... Um, what the research is going to be about or how do you set up the trials and everything? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, first of all, kudos to Dr. Deborah Mesh. What a force yeah. of nature she is. Yeah. Um, and we should sit back and recognize that she really stuck her neck out to back Ibogaine when Howard Lotsoff introduced yeah. it to her in 1991. And she managed to whip up enough energy and focus to take it to the FDA and There's a whole story about what happened there and why they basically blocked funding, which I'll be covering in the conference. But yeah, no, it's great that she's got a second crack of the whip and that she's in, you know, it's exactly right that she's in a position of authority to come back with Ibogaine um, in the Atai context. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a massive respect to her. Um, in terms of the research, yeah, the sweet spot for Ibogaine is clearly opioid addiction, um, you know, whether it's OxyContin, like painkiller addiction, which is huge, um, not just in North America, but also growing bigger and bigger in, in Europe and, and elsewhere. And Mexico, it's a, it's, a, it's a growing phenomenon. So, yeah, the sweet spot is the three opioid receptors that Ibogaine resets, the delta, the mu, and the kappa opioid receptors, and returns to a pre-addictive pre state. Um, so yeah, that's the number one target and it'll be the target for our clinical trials. What's different now, Anne, though, is that we, you know, for Ibogaine providers is we live in the time of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs and Indian labs com competing with chi Chinese labs, competing with labs in Canada to produce new analogs of fentanyl. Um, and nobody can keep up with that. So it's really, really important when you are preparing to do Ibogaine that you're tested to know what's on board. Um, and, and, you know, how can you test if you don't, if the substance is not recognized, you know, it's a brand new analog mm -hmm. of fentanyl. And um, so 
the trend has been to lower doses, uh, more conservative doses across a slightly longer period of time. So yeah, the research has to be, you know, uh, I began in the era of fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Um, we, in terms of the clinical trials, will be focusing more simply on um, intravenous heroin use, because just to keep things simple. Um, but yeah, I began, just to take a breath about this, I began um, as potentially far more wide reaching application than simply addiction, whether it's heroin or cocaine, cocaethylene, as you mentioned, or methamphetamine and, and alcoholism and so on. So there's some very interesting research being done. Uh, you should have these these people on your show, um, Marcus and Amber. Oh, Ram yeah, Capone, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Capone, exactly. So, you know, they're sending Navy SEALs down to Mexico, uh, you know, with traumatic brain injury and PTSD and having stellar results. And then, you know, they're working with Stanford University. So the thing, you know, and I do not want to compare and say, oh, I began to the granddaddy and it's better than I... I find that childish, but, you know, Ibogaine has got a lot of mileage simply because it's, it, you know, it's, it's, its power is also its drawback because it's multi-targeting, you know, it's hitting the opioid receptors, the NMDA receptor, it's serotonergic, it, you know, it interacts with the serotonin transporter, uh, it stimulates the production of glial cell-derived neurotrophic factor, it hits the nicotinic receptors, and on and on and on. It's like, what the heck is this thing doing to the brain? It's not just tweaking, you know, 5-HT2A receptor. And so it's complicated and it's beyond our neuroscience to understand what the heck is going on with Ibogaine, truth be told. And it's cardiotoxic, it slows the heart down. So, but that is also its power, you know, the fact that it can restructure the brain, um, sprout new dopamine neurons from the VTA, you know, potentially an application for Parkinsonism as well as traumatic brain injury. So, yeah, you know, what we know of with Ibogaine today in psychedelics is as a potential powerful application for, for addiction. But I think either Ibogaine or its second generation versions of it um, will be, you know, their application for different forms of mental health um, and brain injury is going to take years and years of research ahead of us. But I mean, like if you look at it right now in the context of addiction, you often hear that people talk about it, that they see their life like going backwards or like they, they have this journey like leading back to them being born basically, yeah. and kind of finding in the process, finding the reason why they became addicts to make it very short for people who never heard yeah. of this. And it's a very strange idea to the Western culture that we, maybe hypnosis is kind of close to this, but even there, a lot of people would be afraid to do this because somebody could tell them something under the influence yeah. that they <laughs> didn't want to do. So this kind of kind of almost anxiety around um, leaving your regular consciousness. So can you talk a little bit about how this journey can look like? And because it's, it's, it's basically a week, right? It's not like a trip for six hours and then you kind of ready to go. So if, and maybe also maybe you can just talk about it in a clinical context and in Mexico, like people yeah. checking in and, and so on. Maybe that's because I think that's a, a much longer treatment than any other psychedelic so far. Everybody has different experiences, like with other psychedelics. So it's the first sure, caveat. Yeah. But having mm. said that, a big difference with the serotonergic uh, classic psychedelics is it tends to be less visionary. Um, my experience, for instance, was it was more like a conversation. Um, and it's interesting just thinking about that. One of the alkaloids in um, Tabernanthe aboga, the root, is called telepathine. Um, oh. So, yeah, I would have this just personally. Um, I would ask a question and almost before I just mentally and all before I finished even formulating the question, the answer would come back. Um, and I'd have sort of messages on letters flying past me. So talk about plant teacher. It, it you know, <laughs> um, a, a lot of people, it's Mr. Iboga. It's a masculine, but for me, it was a feminine energy. Mm -hmm. So I think it, I don't think it's masculine or energy or, or feminine. I think it's prior to that. And it, it presents itself in a way that you need it to be presented in. 
um, a bunch of people have uh, tropical African sim symbols, you know, lions and black people. Af an African thing comes up in a lot of the imagery that, that does present. Um, what happens with the experience? Just let me talk briefly about it. So you take uh, Ibogaine or Iboga. Um, Iboga tends to be a bit more visionary than Ibogaine, um, mm -hmm. just because it's got the entourage effect of different molecules. And then within, you know, within an hour or so, you start to feel this thing rumbling away and something's happening. And then for about the first four or five hours, it's the peak experience where, you know, you're overloaded and a bit, bit like a strong psilocybin experience. There's a lot going on. Uh, it can be almost too much. Um, and the ataxia is setting in and you might be throwing up. Um, this is why you need a medical process, which I'll come to in a moment, just to, to monitor all of that stuff. Um, and then sort of six to eight hours in, if you've had a reasonable amount on board, then you're, you're into a kind of remimetic, like a dream state. So it's rather not, not so much visionary, you know, sort of pow powerful psychedelic visions, but more, um, yeah, remimetic, a bit, a bit like, um, you're, you're kind of processing layers and layers of the subconscious and the unconscious, um, and, you know, there might be epiphanies and realizations. And at this point, you know, you, you get taken back to, as you were talking about, and, you know, family trauma could even be epigenetic. It could be, mm -hmm. you know, ancestral trauma. Um, and think, you know, there's the stage is set for resolving or presenting, you know, giving the answer. So some people I know, it's like they're seeing a bank of television screens and they're seeing from the outside this thing being played out. And somehow by this externalization or this distancing, they're able to see it. And it's not just the trauma happening to them, but they understand why the trauma took place, what the circumstance was and that. Distancing sort of pulls away the trauma. So, you know, in that debate between, you know, you've had many times on your podcast, you know, how much does the experience matter? Well, I would say it really does matter. You know, you, mm -hmm. the, viewing the site of the trauma is healing in itself outside of the biochemical side of things. Anyway, to go back to your other point. So a good Ibogaine treatment is, you know, you're preparing well in advance. Um, psychologically, you're having pre-treatment coaching. Um, you're getting to realize that this is, you know, a friend of mine who's a therapist, uh, Ibogaine therapist, it's the hero's journey. You know, you're, go you're going on this massive, massive journey deep into the forest to heal yourself um, and maybe heal your ancestral lineage. You know, you're, you're the one who, you know, can do that mm. healing. And so to realize it's a huge deal and that your intentions must be really serious and practically, you know, make be prepared to make changes to your life after the treatment and all of this kind of thing. Alongside that medical testing, uh, make sure that your metabolic system, your liver is in good working order, your heart, you have to, you know, have your heart tested and on and on psychological assessment. So it's so different to a psychedelic that you have all this stuff to do to be prepared. And in a way, you know, so many people, unfortunately, in addiction, you know, they can't get their act together. They can't wake up and do their bed. Mm -hmm. And so it's good that you have to do all this stuff to be prepared in the optimum setting because it shows that even in the midst of your addiction, you really, really want to do this and you're going to fill in the application form and you're going to figure out where you'll get your tests done and all the rest of it. And if you can't do that, you're not ready for Ibogaine and it will be a waste of everybody's time and, and so on. So the pre-treatment stuff is this big box of activities that need to take place uh, including the therapeutic side. And then arrival, you know, Ibogaine interacts badly with opiates. So one of the tricky things is when people arrive at an Ibogaine clinic, it's the bag search. You know, um, people that have been in addiction have all kinds of devious subroutines of hiding things, being secret, mm. you know, Mm -hmm. So many people in addiction, extremely good at hiding things and masking things, including and lying also, right? I lying. Mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and smuggling things in. And, you know, as a clinic, you're at risk if someone sneaks something in and people have died because they've snuck something in. So there's a whole day one thing of just getting people in and getting them acclimatized and settled down and make sure that they don't interact with people that have come out of their Ibogaine experience because you don't want to have their expectations artificially set by somebody else's experience. 
then you have to have go through testing again and different clinics do it different ways but say day two is when you do the ibogaine sometimes it's day one depending on how much you have to do ahead of times and then again depending on whether you're a stimulant addict or an opiate addict or someone interested in the psychospiritual side of things what happens next you know like i said before if you're an opiate addict it's basically going to be four or five days in bed mooching around moaning and groaning and thinking it's not worked and being supported and people saying look it's fine and then the medical side of it yeah you need nurses you need to be hooked up to an ecg machine you know the blood oxygen needs you know you need oxygen tank you need a defibrillator on standby so it's it's like an emergency room and it, it's difficult you know to get that emergency room medical backup thing there it needs to be there you need to have a doctor there Mm -hmm. At the same time as not not to be too bright white lights and people in, you know, white coats with stethoscopes. You, <laughs> so getting that medical spiritual balance, I think, is really key to a, a really good clinic. And um, yeah, again, to go back to it, you, you don't see that in representations of Ibogaine treatment mm -hmm. so far. But there are many clinics that have got that balance pr pretty well um, so far. Well, the one that you guys work with right now, the uh, was a clear sky. Yeah. This is so. This is the model, the clinic model that you just described. How Clear Sky works, and that you guys are looking into, kind of creating a, a couple of a bunch of other clinics that are working with that model. Of course, in countries so far, I guess, um, where this is possible, right? Because I mean, maybe Canada is because it's always going very faster. That it might be possible there, but other than that, at this point, it would be just Mexico and what what other countries? Well, there are many parts of the world where ibogaine is not regulated, mm -hmm. so it's not illegal, it's not legal, it's just not right. on the statute book. So Mexico is an example of that, but most of the world is like that. Um, so uh, Germany, for instance, is is like that. It's not really? regulated. Yeah. Um, France and oh. Italy, it's illegal for various reasons. Spain, it's not regulated. Portugal, it's not regulated. Um, and on and on and on. So, um, yeah, you, you can be a provider in Germany. I know I know Ibogaine providers in Germany or Switzerland. Mm -hmm. um, there's clinics in Spain and Portugal. Um, not, not in France, as far as I'm aware. Anyway, um, Clear Sky going back to it. So... I began failed to go through clinical trials uh, in the 90s with the FDA in America. Um, and the reason NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, stated was Ibogaine is cardiotoxic, it slows the heart down, um, and it's also neurotoxic. Um, so the cardiotoxicity, we can't deny it. It's, mm -hmm. it. It does slow the heart rate down. If you've got heart issues, it's dangerous. Um, And you need to monitor the heart for the first the heartbeat for the first 24 to 48 hours after treatment. You need nurses and people that know how to read the squiggles on an ECG machine. Um, but none of that is actually a big deal, Anne. Um, you know, it, it, in my experience, you have medical doctors and they can be skeptical about ibogaine, and then they see an ibogaine treatment. And this happened with uh, Dr. Mash, by the way. Mm -hmm. She was skeptical and she went to Holland and she saw a treatment and she was, oh my god, and that's what began her, you know, lifelong project. Um, but doctors that experience an Ibogaine treatment, it's not a big deal to monitor the heart and keep, it's, mm -hmm. it's you know, mm -hmm. it happens in hospitals all the time. Um, and the flip side of this, which we never talk about, is what life is like on methadone or suboxone. Exactly. You know, um, I want to make this point actually, Anne, which is, you know, um, there's a lot of resistance to Ibogaine in mainstream addiction circles. Uh, the harm reduction paradigm is, you know, what we have, the status quo um, in most parts of the world, in Europe, for instance. And, you know, there are definitely benefits to having needle exchanges and, um, you know, accepting addiction for what it is and, and not you know, decriminalizing addiction and all of that. All of that's all good. But surely we can do better than that. Um, but suggesting I began in that circumstance, people, you know, who's, who've built a career on these things, They can sort of not believe it or they say, no, this is snake oil or, and, wow. um, 
And then they can say, oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's toxic. And I've seen this a lot. You know, we put a conference on in Vienna and we went to a needle exchange to try and get people, you know, in the local harm reduction oh, really? wow. interested. Okay. And they were like, no, we're doing work. We're doing work here. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, I respect the fact that people on the front line of addiction do that work. They're heroes, but we can do better than that. And I began it. And the thing about Clear Sky and Dr. Alberto Sola is all of these knee-jerk responses that people have about Ibogaine, it can be safe. You know, um, there's been thousands of patients gone through the door of Clear Sky Cancun. Nobody died. So it's re so-called real-world data. Um, you know, it's interesting. Ibogaine. There was this, this story in Daily Mail when Matthew Mellon oh, yes. um, died. And I remember, like, when it came out, the story, it was like, yeah, he died because of this treatment and then a couple of days later it was exactly. just like also in daily Mail. well no he died actually because he went on a bender and took strange mixed strange substances in mexico and i, was I like, followed Whoa, that story this i so followed that story exactly like you yeah. did on the daily mail the yeah. first one you know billionaire dies yeah. of mm. overdose with psychedelic and then obviously it got round to uh, clear sky people and yeah he didn't he didn't die in the clinic he didn't, he didn't die even get there He so, didn't get there. And yeah. um, many of the Ibogaine deaths are um, not, well, they're not, none of them are to do with Ibogaine directly. They're to do with an either, it's an interaction between the Ibogaine and something else that they smuggled in, talking about the smuggle mm -hmm. in thing, mm -hmm. or it's something else. They had a heart attack. Um, and that's the thing, you know, um, people in addiction can often be unhealthy. Um, you know, they've not looked after themselves. And so, People in addiction often die, you know. <laughs> Most Young, people actually, in also. a heavy addiction don't get get to be old. But um, I mean, I want to quickly come back to the to yeah. this narrative thing you, you just talked about because mm. it's so interesting because tomorrow on Amazon the a new TV show is starting um, based on Christiane F. I don't know if you heard about that movie. It's one of the most successful movies in Germany based on the story of a young heroin addict in the late 70s. And it's like, you know, every country has their success movies, like their signature, like Monty Python in England. So, and Christiana F. is one of these movies in Germany. And it's really very stylish if you watch the the old version from the late 70s. Um, and of course, the new version on Amazon is very stylish too. It looks like a current Gucci uh, ad, actually. So, and, but the narrative is still like, okay, there's this bunch of young people getting into heroin in, in late Berlin 70s and kind of some of them die some of them uh, become a kind of a teen prostitute to get drugs and of course you you know that Amazon probably did this uh, series again because it was extremely successful as a movie and kind of a so-called cult movie maybe but the narrative is still the one from the late 70s that yeah. actually the drug addiction is not really told in the way it should be told today. It would, would have been a great opportunity, but I'm sure it doesn't. I mean, of course, I'm going to watch it, but do you know what I mean? And it's very interesting that this whole, what you said with this going in, in Vienna to the, the needle exchange, that, I mean, and the same goes with alcohol, like AA meetings, where people th say, if you don't go to meetings, this is you will never be re recover from this. So, but but still, the old idea of addiction is still not much, not very much looking into why people became addicts, right? It's just kind of um, okay, you're sober for like 50 days, and then something bad happens to you, and you you're gone. I mean, I lived in California, and I went for research back then. I went to a couple of meetings, and um, it it was so interesting that the energy in these rooms were very. Um, desperate because people always kind of seem to know okay look I can go here it's kind of a support system but I know kind of it's not gonna last so and, and why do you think this old narrative also in entertainment or in the movies or whatever you want to call it why is this so strong why isn't it just looking into new research and just maybe come up with a new idea of Christiana F for example brilliant questions I enjoyed listening to you there Okay, there's a, 
there's a lot. You have to answer it. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot in what you said. So, uh, you know, I, I can find myself having a knee jerk response to 12 step. Mm. Um, and, and, and the other side of me is saying, saying, you know, in response to that response, how dare you, you haven't been in addiction. You don't want it, know what it's like, but looking in on it from the outside and, you know, having spent a lot of time with people that have gone through the 12 steps and it's failed for them and people that have gone through the 12 steps and it's been a little bit successful. What I would say about the 12 steps as it is, is definitely it offers community and, um, you know, it's an, in an emergency situation mm -hmm. where you've been triggered and you're spiraling downwards, it saves lives um, and gives you, you know, there is solidarity and sisterhood and brotherhood. Um, and I do like the first step, which is recognize that you've got a problem that's bigger than you, than you alone mm -hmm. can solve. Mm -hmm. come, coming to that sort of moment on your knees where in supplication help, you know, the cry of help and uh, acknowledging that absolutely people in addiction who don't get to that first stage can't save themselves. So it's unavoidable, the first step for me. And the 12th step I really like, which is giving back and service to others, you know, having gone through the journey. So I love the first step and the 12th step. <laughs> it's the stuff in the middle. Okay. The kind yeah, of quasi religious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been, I've listened to some of the lessons, you know, just for today stuff and just, I recoil. It's, you know, I, again, my North European Protestant anti-authoritarian, I just can't do it. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's exactly something that is, yeah, have, has a lot of impact already that you can't do that. Um, and it's a shame we've been stuck with it because it is out of date. And I think just to go to the core of what you were saying um, is the new route to to getting yourself out of addiction is completely grounded in self empowerment. It's not an institutional mm -hmm. set of instructions from outside. Thou shalt do that. You know, quasi Christian. Thou shalt do this. Thou behave like this. Otherwise, and celebrate. You know, childishly celebrating how many days you've been abstinent and all of that. It's like you have the tools within yourself, and now there are the tools outside to give you that helping hand to go on your own journey, your own hero's journey. And I think it goes back to that fear, that institutional, collective, legal fear of what a society would be like where there's a bunch of individuals who are really deeply psychically empowered. You know, it's a, it's a, there's a kind of, uh, talk about field consciousness. There is an element of the field of consciousness which has been colonized or penetrated by state structures. Um, And so that's why, you know, psychedelics have been banned for so long. This idea of, you know, Graham Hancock's idea of sovereignty of your own consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. are, there's all kinds of subtle cues just dampening down on that. And so, yeah, I see 12 step as just another state-based colonization or indoctrination and the opposite of it. But yeah. Because also the, the 13th step, which, mm -hmm. as you know, probably got erased, was the psychedelic experience. But then the co-founders couldn't agree on this and it was just 12. But I mean, in England, I, I remember researching years ago that Ibogaine has, is pretty, I mean, I want to say well known, but there are a couple of researchers. And then also I think mm -hmm. Ben Sessa in, in, in Bristol is doing great work also in terms of yeah. alcohol addiction. So, but I mean, yeah. what, I mean, are there any, let's say, kind of, for efforts to maybe just go, let's say, into an AA meeting in London, for yeah. example, and say like, guys, we have a free <laughs> Ibogaine experience. Why don't you just try it? I mean, like selling, I mean, it sounds crazy maybe, but selling like um, a better solution to people. Yeah, it's, it's definitely the next step to use the yeah. same metaphor. Um, and it's something we talk about a lot in Universal Ibogaine, engaging with, mm -hmm. you know, street practitioners, harm reduction um, people on the front, warriors on the front line doing this heroic work um, and not being, you know, better than thou, you know, oh, you poor you, you're in the old paradigm. It's to listen to that. You know, that's the mm -hmm. way forwards. It's, it's to learn from the things that have worked for them and, and to get their buy-in across time. So 
Yes, uh, undoubtedly with psychedelics, um, t there'll be, and there already are versions of 12 step, which are now sort of psychedelically supported. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a kind of minority thing within the 12 step community, but it's such a vast community that, you know, there are pockets of that already happening. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. interesting. I noticed for, uh, Beckley found talk about the UK, the Beckley foundation, oh, yeah, okay. Amanda mm -hmm. Fielding announced yeah, today. Nice. Oh, Oh, the Beckley Foundation is going into Ibogaine research. And I was like, yay. Did she, did, was it today? Did she say today? This morning. Oh, uh, wow. Amazing. Just before, this pod, just before we started recording. Oh, that's great. Um, and she was talking about, and Amanda Fielding was talking about Puiti. And I, I'm thinking, okay. She's you know, the, the couple of times I've sat next to her at your conferences, I've said, Amanda, what about Ibogaine? Oh, we're busy with other things. <laughs> like, yeah. And um so, yeah, I think I began to time, you know, as the kind of Cinderella that never got to go to the psychedelic ball. I think it's over. I think, you know, everybody and his brother is doing psilocybin or LSD or LSD analogs and this and that. And, but I mean, now it's a time also, I mean, uh, Imperial starts to research 5DMT, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think like, and Atai is researching 12 substances. So mm -hmm. I think now it's a little bit like in 21, I feel like other substances, like 2020 was the year of psilocybin. Yes. And now it's kind of the others. Okay, what about the others? Like, because um, there are other substances that have different uh, talents, maybe. Yeah, and you know, also. the point I'd, yeah, I'd like to make a point there, uh, and which is, um, it's again, this not this neither nor type thing, or this is better than that. I think in the future, it won't be one molecule, one treatment. You know, there'll be, For instance, if you look at addiction, it's often bound up with trauma and PTSD from childhood. Mm -hmm. um, and there's layers and layers of things to unpack, you know, neurophysiologically, but also in terms of, you know, conditioned amygdala response, the kind of things that Ben Sessa talks about so well. Anyway, all of that is to say that somebody may, you know, have addiction and depression, and they may come in for treatment and they have the Ibogaine to reset the neural circuitry. They have a lot of therapy, uh, energy work, breath work, all of that kind of thing. Then they may have a uh, 5-MeO-DMT experience, which, which happens in the underground scene as well. It's already like this admixture of therapy molecules and whatnot. Mm -hmm. okay. So at, at the moment, because where we are in psychedelics is, you know, a lot of the conversation is on drug development. And so we separate out these molecules because of the drug development, but in the real world and where we're headed, I think it's going to be, um, you know, different protocols, different molecules working at different times with each other as appropriate and relevant to the condition that the patient has. And, and what is your, like, let's say vision for, for universal ibogaine in five years, because now we know that in one year, so many things can happen. And on top of things is that after the pandemic has um, stopped or ended, um, or is everybody's vac got a vaccination, you guys are very lucky in, in England, by the way, um, <laughs> with that. So, but after this, like everybody expects a very big PTSD situation yeah. from 20 and 2020 and 21. So, Obviously, things have to go fast right now to prevent like an even bigger mental health crisis. Mm. So, what what is your what is your um, accelerator program for Universal Ibogaine to catch up with these developments? I wish that you know I'm the voice of conservatism in the company. Oh, okay. Other other people, we can do this, we can do that, regulatory innovation, all of this. And I find myself saying, wait, 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 it's cardiotoxic. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we, the regulator is conservative. Um, we, it failed already in, with the FDA in the 90s. So, yeah, it's really tough because long COVID, I'll be talking about this, long COVID, you know, is a set of neurological symptoms which are very debilitating. And I believe microdosing um, Ibogaine is one way out um, because it's so neuro generative and neurotrophic um, in a much more powerful way. Yes, psilocybin is neurotrophic, but Ibogaine on a whole nother level is neurotrophic um, in terms of the growth of new neurons and, uh -huh. and whatnot. Okay. And it's wow. application against Parkinson's disease. You know, there's many, many stories now of reversing Parkinson's with Ibogaine. Are you doing so we it? need it. Um, so yes, I think microdosing Ibogaine um, for long COVID is definitely something that should be researched sooner rather than later. 
but yeah, it's it's gonna you know look at look at how long it's taken for MDMA with maps, even yeah. with all the support they've had. Um, and ibogaine is a much dirtier, more complex molecule. So I do fear that there's going to be a few years where it's still not legally available. Um, people will still be going to Mexico or wherever it is. Um, I, you know, you, you you may know that there's now a push to establish Buiti churches in the U.S. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Just just like with ayahuasca and the Native like American Santa church. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Because precisely because of this, because the pain, um, the alienation, the, the trauma is so deep now that it, it's just pushing through the surface how it can. So, but I do fear there'll be a few years in terms of like the gap between regulatory approval and demand. There'll be a few painful years where you know the two can't meet each other. Um, but that's just going to mean more underground treatments. There's mm. a YouTube video of a guy. Uh, I won't say his name, but he basically checks into a hotel in Denver um, mm. and does an Ibogaine, you know, Denver decriminalized and does an Ibogaine treatment. And what's happening is, you know, his provider's on FaceTime and he's like, yeah, oh. take the test dose now. How are you feeling? Okay, yeah, you can take the Ibogaine now. How are you doing? Oh, <laughs> God. Yeah. It's a bit like dosed. It's just not how it should be. So, but there will be a, a few years gap. Um, for all psychedelics before they're approved and, you know, underground experimentation and whatnot. And it just has to, has to be that way because from a health regulator's perspective, you do have to be sure about these things. Even MDMA, mm. if you're following it, uh, the FDA have requested for um, the more safety studies in phase three. Why? Why? I speculating. I think it's because MDMA is um, hypertensive, you know, can raise the blood, blood pressure. So, you know, regulators have to be, and, and COVID is the outlier here because the vaccines were pushed through and um, I'm worried if there's any potential long-term negative effects of the vaccines. I don't understand the effects of an MR. You know, I know that there's, you know, I'm not a stupid anti-vaxxer, but, um, you know, this thing was rushed through very quickly and we, mm. we don't know what um, mRNA vac vaccines with a spike protein, which hasn't got the virus, do. We just don't know. I'm not saying, oh, it affects the DNA and all this and all that. I'm just saying we don't know. So mm -hmm. we have to be careful rushing anything through, uh, whether a psychedelic or not. This is the conservative voice because I want it to be forever. You know, I want it not to be kicked out. Yeah, no, I think that's that's good to have a to have several. I mean, I also kind of feel that. I mean, if I had, I mean coming from my personal experience, I also sometimes have to, to think, oh, don't tell everybody, everybody should do it because it helped me exactly. to do this and this. And I mean, um, we, we just talked about it this morning. I just started um, like a ketamine psychotherapy. And for me, it's incredible what this brings out and how it helps me. But then mm -hmm. again, for other people, this might be not really the right thing to do. And this is kind of difficult to just really stay calm about it and i think it's the right way also to go and to not just tell people to go so somewhere to some apartment in in east berlin for a weekend and do ayahuasca for example it's not a good idea i think to do that yeah i i think it's good to have conservative forces pushing back on too much speed in in these things and mm -hmm. um Ben Sessa makes the point that um, some people don't want to have a psychedelic experience. They want to be healed, but they don't want to have this crazy it's thing true. and go yeah. back to their trauma sure. and they don't want to deal with it. So a non-psychedelic uh, adapted, you know, analog is beneficial. You know, it's not either or, or mm -hmm. my thing is better agree. than yours. Mm -hmm. And how dare you think about taking the psychedelic experience out of the molecule? No, 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 no. Different people have different needs and uh, let's yeah. be inclusive about that. That's a great Famous last words, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that I mean, I, I already was expecting that that we wouldn't have such a straight business talk, which I really appreciate because we have very different approaches in terms of psychedelics on the show. And yeah. um, so I think that, of course, Ibogaine is really the, the most unknown to most people still. And they just have like, I mean, they know Deborah Mesh and know what she talked about, but she being in Miami and being, um, what I, when we talked about, it was pretty much about the, like 
the whole waves of cocaine addiction that were flooding yeah. Miami and Miami Vice. Miami Vice, right. And then that's why it's called the Miami Vice Molecule. But I have to say, I was really, when she talk, talked about the Miami Vice Molecule, this was such an eye opener to me for so many people. And because here in Berlin, I mean, you, you in London or you were in London, I mean, it's a very big party city too. Pretty much everybody had that problem, obviously, without even knowing that they had that kind of much stronger addiction than just alcohol or just cocaine. Mm -hmm. So, and it was like a total common thing to like, everybody mixed it. It's just, why would you just do one thing? It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and this kind of, if you think back in your, uh, let's say your own party times Hmm. makes you like think about that time very in a very different way and I mean like I said like even with this TV show that's coming out now that has um, it's very kind of interesting to re review uh, the German idea of heroin for example which was created in Germany and by Bayer actually and, uh, you, I was just thinking as you were talking Anne that um, if you think about young people you know uh, younger than generation Z Mm. You know, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, what addictions they're going through now are uh, likely to be less about substances and much mm -hmm. more to do with, you know, Instagram and digital addiction and all of that. Yeah. And uh, that's what's going to be coming up next and um, how we deal mm. with, with that form, especially in the time of, you know, covid so we better be pre prepared for that because in just a few short years' time, they'll they'll you know they'll be adults and you know expected to be responsible, and um, so that will be the next wave of healing that we that psychedelics will have to face, I think, and uh, something we we aren't talking about at the moment. Yeah, and that's another narrative that should be more popular or more com more in the public that addiction doesn't need substances, for example. Absolutely, and that's no. I think it's it's going to be the big thing. It's mm. going to replace. Uh, addiction, um, substance-based addiction in the next few years is um, dig digital addiction and uh, gambling addiction and all of that, these kind of things. Um, Computer-based, IT-based, I mean, internet it's also... addiction. Porn consumption under COVID, you probably know, it's gone through you, the you roof. Porn had like a really, what was it like? They had this free, for a month, they had a free yeah. website. <laughs> COVID deals. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, um, yeah, we, we better be attuned to the changing nature of, of addiction because it's, uh, yeah, it, it changes very quickly. Um, yeah. So, and yeah, so we, we're not talking about it at the moment. We need to. If you think about um, my experience in Gabon um, mm -hmm. with Buiti was, you know, you've got uh, young kids, like, you know, knee high to a grasshopper taking iboga during the ceremony. So wow. it's, it is another conversation to have about at what age um, children should, you know, it's a bit like French people giving their kids a sip of wine sort of around the With dinner 10. table at, at 10 or whatever. <laughs> so what age <laughs> Westerners, you know, and, you know, having a young family of you're in a psychedelic milieu, first of all, when you come out to your kids, um, when you have that conversation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, you know, um, not to sort of like hide it from them and at what age they should have dip their toes as well in, into, into that world. And I don't have any answers, but these are the kind of things we need to start talking about as, as psychedelics matures. Well, I mean, what's definitely the case is that, uh, let's say like friends of mine who have teenage daughters, they follow every second what, what Billie Eilish is posting on Twitter because she's so open about, well, right. today I was really depressed and today I feel really shitty. So, and then next day, oh, I feel better. So it's just really like a total normal thing to just um, consult with your mental health on a daily basis and um, tell everybody about it. That That's a whole new thing. Yeah, and one of the things we're attuned to at Universal Ibogaine, I'm sure like other psychedelics companies, is just the role of influencers. Um, mm -hmm. So in the case of addiction, um, <clears throat> slightly separately to this is just the whole realm of sports and addiction. You know, elite sports, you name, you name the sport. Um, there's massive issues with addiction, you know, keeping people performing. True. 
Mm. Powering through injuries, all of that is powered by, you know, OxyContin, painkillers, opiates, um, and then the resulting addiction, it's like, oh, well, he's retired now. It doesn't matter, you know. They're yeah, that's, that's the, the Daniel Carcillo story. Like, exactly. It's, it's exactly class- what he talked about. Like, he was exactly. just like, okay, now you can go. Bye. Yep. Kind of. Like, yep. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's, you know, you know sport, it's sports influencing around psychedelics, I think, is going to be huge. really, really important. And also challenging what happens in sports. I mean, even with football, you know, like UK football, not American football or whatever, uh, German football, um, just the potential for traumatic brain injury from heading the ball. I mean, it sounds sounds pathetic in a way, but it's a real risk um, well, I that mean, footballers uh, get. That one, but also like in general, there was this one uh, goalkeeper, um, Robert... I unfortunately I forgot his name, but like ten, five, ten years ago, he killed himself, 36 years old, and he was super successful. And his wife, she opened up like a foundation to help people with depression. So depression in, in athletes is another whole thing. I mean, that the whole this whole one uh, episode from HBO Sports with Mike Tyson and also Daniel, I think, mm-hmm. kind of coming out as. Um, to yeah as a person who is looking into psychedelics for um help their depression or their their suicidal tendencies and um it's just a whole i mean like it's so interesting like a year ago this would have been like impossible hbo sports yeah. on athletes yeah. doing psychedelics it is part of this accelerated accelerationism ex- yeah the the speed at which discourses can come up and get mainstream now which is um, good I think. It's good, but I do, there is a part of me which is just slow down, slow down, slow down. Mm-hmm. Let's take a breath, you know, let's not. Jinx it. So, yeah, I, I do have a conservative aspect around that, especially just ensuring that this is well institutionalized and gets well embedded into existing. You know, just the, the world is full of psychiatrists. And this is not part of their world. And no, they're the not at all. Professionals. It's true. And, you know, it needs to be... How much does psychiatry change in the era of psychedelics? Well, that's a whole nother conversation, mm-hmm. but the emphasis should be on people that have gone through the training, you know, rather than... Absolutely. Sure. Well, you have da- you have David Nutt in your country, so you, you're you good to go. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the conference tomorrow. I'm on at, yeah, tw- at midnight, cool. actually, which is... <laughs> Gonna be really yeah. great. <laughs> so. You know, hanging out with Americans and Canadians involves late nights. Late nights, exactly. Experience. Yeah. All right. Thank you for being on the show. It was super interesting, and yeah. it's great that we had this kind of more of a, f- a free flowing conversation. Absolutely, I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, and uh, have a great day. And where are you now in London? Near Manchester, Manchester. in the village. Okay. Yeah. You're safe and not close to London. So. <laughs> Okay. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.